Good morning. Kind of nice to be here all together in one service, isn't it? <laughs> it's good to see you. Thank you for coming out. For those watching online, thank you for joining us. It's great to have you. We're going to open with prayer here in a moment, but a couple things I want to make you aware of. First and foremost, well, not first, not foremost, but first, is we have our business meeting this Tuesday. So if you can come, please do. A reminder email will be sent out. We're trying to get a head count of how many are coming. So if you do plan on coming, please let the church office know. Okay. I think foremost, I think, will be an update from the Whites, Ru Dr. Russ White in Tenwick Hospital. And I'm going to read some of this for us. So that's uh, some good information for us to know. Russ and Beth White are in the States now, as his mom passed away on June 19th. Her funeral will be in Michigan on August 1st. Please pray for comfort for Russ and his family. It was a wild journey for them to be able to get to the U.S. They had a false positive for COVID-19, which obviously drew some concern on being back for the funeral. And they were told they would not be able to fly out of Kenya. Russ then contacted a contact he has with the CDC, and they were retested, and the test came back negative. Uh, they were providentially able to get seats on an embassy uh, repatriation flight, and they're now in the States. COVID has changed the whole world, including Kenya. Selective surgeries were stopped in Kenya, but of the 400 cardiac patients waiting for surgery, 124 were urgent, meaning to do surgery, they probably die within eight weeks. Russ had worked nonstop and has had not had a day off since July 2019. It's a long time without a day off. Working through these 124 patients for four weeks, when done, they saw that the list was now grown to 140. They were doing their best to get all the patients done and taken care of, so please pray for rest and peace for them and for comfort for the whole family. Pray for Russ, that he can be refreshed while he's home in the States. Pray for the patient. The patients back in Kenya are heavy on his mind, so please pray that God gives them a sense of peace over all those patients still waiting and needing. And with him out of the country, the, those open heart surges aren't happening. So they're waiting for him to come back. So they're really heavy on his mind. So we're going to pray for our service. We're going to pray for the whites. We're going to pray for the family of the loss and also for Tenwick Hospital this morning. So please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, you are, are in the interruptions of life. You show up in many ways. I can think through scripture many times people's lives were interrupted and there you were. Uh, the woman at the well, the, the man lowered through the roof, the, the blind men, the, the lame. You showed up and you interrupted. Uh, Lord, thank you that you are in the interruptions. Lord, and I pray uh, for us as your local body that in the interruption of COVID-19 and all that is going on in the world that we represent and honor you well, that we are first shown to be uh, having love for one another uh, because that is a main evidence that we are yours and that we belong to you. Help us to be a bright light to the people. Help us to reflect who you are uh, and draw. I pray you'd use that to draw more people to you. Lord, we pray for the, the whites. First, pray that you would comfort their family on their loss. Father, I pray that while they're home, they have an opportunity to have their cups filled, uh, that they are recharged, that they are able to draw near to you and be renewed. Lord, I pray for the patients back in Kenya who are waiting for these surgeries, Lord. You are sovereign, and I pray that you would provide for their needs as well. I pray that the timing is perfect in all things. I pray you give Russ confidence that you are on the throne, that you are the ultimate healer, and you are the man in charge. Lord, we pray for their comfort. We pray while they're here again that they rest. And Lord, we pray for the work at Tenwick Hospital. Lord, I pray you continue to use it 
as a light in that area of the world, that as they perform surgeries, they continue to share the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you just reap a wonderful harvest through their ministry. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, some of you may know I have a kind of a long commute every day, and I see a lot of vanity plates. I don't know about you, but uh, that drives me crazy when I can't figure out what they mean. With, it's like, what is that? I think about it all the time. What does that mean? Um, same with bumper stickers. I see a lot of bumper stickers. And one that I saw recently said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And it, at first I'm like, yeah, amen. Um, but then as I got to thinking about that, God, it should, should read, God said it, that settles it. The fact that I believe it or we believe it doesn't make God's truth any more real. You know, it's, uh, God said it, that's it, that settles it. Whether I believe it or not, it doesn't matter. His truth is the truth. So uh, I was thinking about that, how it relates to the world these days. And, you know, a lot of people uh, have a, a skewed belief of, of what the truth is. And we have to remember that uh, God is the same yesterday, forever, and, and today. And so as we sing, uh, as we stand and sing, if you wouldn't mind standing, thank you. Um, we're going to keep those thoughts in mind that God is the same yesterday, uh, today, and forever. So please stand.
earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name.
we thank you that you are mighty to save, Lord, and I'm sure that each one of us has someone different in mind as we're singing that song, Lord, who you are mighty to save, or what you're mighty to save us from, or what you're mighty to save, whether it's a marriage, or it's a broken heart, or it's a job, or a person, Lord God, we just thank you that you're capable of all of it. You are awesome, and we love you so much, and we thank you for this opportunity to gather together this morning collectively, Lord God, and even those who are not here but are celebrating with us, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have, the freedom that we have to do that. We invite you to be the center of it all, Lord, and we ask that you work in our hearts and our minds this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to use this one today instead of the other one since uh, I don't have the actual headset portion of it. So I can't, uh, can't go very far without the power, and uh, that will tie into our sermon. That was not a planned illustration, by the way. Uh, well, good morning. I'm excited uh, to be here with you, and thank you for uh, working with us as we made a few changes in trying to do our service. It's really great to see uh, you here today. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 3, Romans 3. If you're watching on the live stream, I want to welcome you. Uh, hopefully you have your Bible and a set of notes with you as well. As you know, we were gone last week on vacation. We had a great time up north, and I appreciate Jared filling in while I was gone. I know there was some sound glitches uh, last week for those who are watching online or for any of you who watched it online, you know that there was just a few issues. We had ordered some equipment and it's very possible that one of the cables that we received uh, was messed up. And so we've changed out that cable. Hopefully everything is working well today. Uh, for those who are present here, I appreciate you being patient and once again working with us as we've made some changes here. Uh, and hopefully this will carry us out through the rest of the summer. I do have one quick announcement for you, and then we'll go into our prayer time. And once again, I just want to remind you of the business meeting this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to join us on that. I think we will try to live stream that as well. For those who can't come in, at least you'll be able to hear. We'll just at least turn it on and uh, let those be able to do that. But hopefully most of you will be able to join us here. So as we go into our prayer time, I want to put up another picture, some pictures of Mookie, and give you all some things to pray for as we go into our time of prayer. Uh, Mookie has done really well. For those who do not know, Mookie's a little boy that we've been praying for for a little bit over a month. He went into the hospital a little over a month ago with what was they thought was just a stomach issue and discovered he had stage 3 lymphoma, a very aggressive one. And so he's done really well the past couple of weeks. His chemo started... And, uh, and his mom wrote the following a couple of days ago. She said, he has responded amazingly to the chemo and has minimal side effects. Uh, we're, we've been blown away as we've been bracing for a really hard week physically for him. And I really do think it's prayers. Uh, he's been exercising and walking every day and slowly gaining some of his weight and muscle mass back. It's been amazing to see his progress. He'll have another spinal tap tomorrow, which would have been yesterday morning, and uh, the, 
The most exciting thing is that he may be able to go home as early as sometime next week if his immunity levels allow him. As always, thank you so much for your love and for your prayers. So as we pray silently, as we normally do, just take a moment to pray for your family, those that are sitting around you. If you're watching, please pray silently for your family there. And then after a moment of silent prayer, we'll all pray together, Lord, speak to me. And during that time of silent prayer, please lift up Mookie as well. So let's pray together. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, speak to me. Amen. You know, on February the 9th, we started this series in the book of Romans. Uh, we have spent most of our time since looking at sin and looking at condemnation. I couldn't wait for this Sunday to get here. Uh, I've been waiting on this Sunday since we started this series. Today, we will have a shift in our study as we begin to look at God's salvation. But in one sense, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Let's just do a quick review and, uh, and see where we've been. We're, we're kind of at a high point right now looking out. So let's look back a little bit, see what we've accomplished so far, and then we'll move forward. We began by looking at Paul's salutation and his theme. His salutation to the Romans is found in the first seven verses, and he jumps right in after saying his hello by talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his humanity and his deity. And after he shares that, he talks about his love for the Romans, that he couldn't wait to come and see them and to be with them. And his coming wasn't just to say hello, it was to help equip them to help give them some things that would help them to grow. And he told them that, he, that he, he was obligated to share this truth with them, but it wasn't only an obligation, he was eager to do it. And then in verses 16 and 17, we have the theme of the book of Romans, where he tells them he's not ashamed of the gospel, because it's in that gospel that God's righteousness is revealed to people from faith to faith. It is the power of God for salvation. And so, but having said that, he helps us to see immediately that that righteousness of God is lacked by everyone. And the result of that is condemnation. That's chapter 1, verses 18 through 320. He, he's going to show that God's righteousness is lacked by the Gentiles, in the balance of chapter 1, by those who were moral in chapter 2, as well as those who were religious in the latter part of chapter 2 and the first parts of chapter 3. And those religious people specifically, he'll reference the Jews because he's one of them, and they were the prime example of that religion. And then, lest anybody have any questions or any doubts, he gives the idea in, of all humanity in chapter 3, verses 9 through 20 where he gives a series of Old Testament quotations to show everyone that they lack the righteousness which God to provide. It's at this point that Paul will make a major shift. Now, I think of it as a watershed moment. Let me give you all a definition. A watershed is a geographical term originally. The area that drains into a single river is the watershed for that river. Watershed can also mean a ridge, like that formed by a chain of mountains, which sends water in two different directions. And two different rivers can potentially come out of it on either side. From this understanding, watershed has come to mean a turning point or a dividing line in social life. When we were on vacation uh, last week, or two weeks ago now, uh, we drove by the Evans Notch on Highway 113. It's one of the lesser known notches here in New Hampshire, at least for us. We don't, obviously, are not as familiar with it as some of the other notches. What's interesting is that the Saco River starts on one side of the Evans Notch 
and, and the Androscoggin immediately starts on the other side of it. Depending on which side the water goes, it becomes a part of the Saco or a part of the Androscoggin River. Now, I've listed a few dates for us, as you can see in your notes or on the screen, that became watershed moments for our country. And I've listed, listed some of the somewhat recent ones. December 7, 1941. For a lot of people, you hear that date and you immediately think of what President Roosevelt said, a day that will live in infamy when Pearl Harbor was attacked. For most of us, we come to a more recent date. We think of 9-11, September 11th of 2001. That was a watershed moment for us in the sense that for many of us, life was pre-9-11 and post-9-11. How about December 31 of 2019, just a little over seven months ago, almost exactly seven months ago? There was a cluster of cases, a few cases that were termed pneumonia when they were first witnessed in Wuhan, China. On January 13th, the first case outside of China was diagnosed in Thailand. On January 30th, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern. On March the 11th, it was declared a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic. I remember on March 15th, driving down to Connecticut, as Daniel took a train up from New York City because his contract had been canceled. And obviously, for all of us at this point, you can see by the way we're seated, you can see by the fact that we're wearing masks, everything has been pre-COVID and post-COVID. It's a watershed moment when we see those kinds of things. Now, watershed moments aren't only on a national or international scale. They're very personal as well. I put two dates up there for you, January 15th and August 15th. January 15th of 1981 may not mean a whole lot to a whole lot of people, but it means a lot to me. That's when I came to know Christ. And so consequently for me, everything was pre, whoa, was pre January 15th and post January 15th. It was pre coming to know Christ and post coming to know Christ. That was the watershed moment for me when life transformed. August 15th, 1987. That's when I went from life just being all about FOAD <laughs> to now I can't make any decisions without having Karen being involved. Even when we're not together, she is still a part of who I am. And so that was a watershed moment. So we begin to understand that. What we're coming to here in the book of Romans is one of those great, great watershed moments. Now, let me give you all a couple of thoughts about these next 11 verses. Donald Gray Barnhouse has 19 sermons on these 11 verses. Martin Lloyd-Jones has an entire volume in his 15-volume commentary on the six verses, 21 through 26. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, by many people, including me, so I'm in there with a bunch of people, who believe this is the single greatest paragraph in the entire Bible. For me, it is the summit of the Bible. It is the Mount Everest of the Bible. Tom Nelson said, and he's quoting a theologian who said, if the bad people come and they confiscate all our Bibles, he said, take Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26 and memorize them. And then you will have what you need to be able to proclaim to the rest of the world what God has done on our behalf in this one paragraph. Everything else in the Bible you can say helps illustrate this because God gives us so much in this one paragraph. I mean, there have been expositors that have gone far more than Donald Gray Barnhouse. There have been people who have taken three, four, five months to teach through this one little paragraph. I'm not going to do that, okay? I'm going to try to cover it in three weeks, hopefully. Today we're going to look at verses uh, 21 through 23. And so hopefully God will use those to, to minister to us. What Paul is going to do at this point, he is going to talk about that God's righteousness, which he's already demonstrated, condemns people. 
he's going to begin talking about the fact that God's righteousness has been imputed to us. Now, that may be a different word, a new word for you, impute or imputation. That's a good word to know. It's a great theological term. It simply means that something that someone has is reckoned to someone else's account. What God has has been reckoned or given into our account is what Paul is going to do for us here. He's going to demonstrate that, okay? So follow along as I read verses uh, 21 through 23. You see them on the screen as well. It says, uh, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, verse 23 is probably the one that you're most familiar with because it's part of the Romans road that so many of us memorize after becoming a Christian. And I also realize that when you look at it, you say, hey, listen, you stopped in the middle of the sentence. I understand that. The sentence does continue. But this is going to give us plenty to cover for today. Okay? So let's start looking at this. Your, your first set of notes are going to tell you this is a continental divide. But now. I want you to think about those two words. But now. This is the watershed. And I refer to it here as a continental divide. A continental divide is basically a watershed on a huge scale. The Rocky Mountains are the continental divide for our country. Everything, every river on the west side of the Rockies is going to end up in the Pacific. Every ice flow, every melting ice on the east side of it is eventually going to end up in the Atlantic. It is a water. They start together at the Rockies, but they end up in polar opposite places. What Paul does with these two words is, but now, everything before this, but now, is talking about God's righteousness and condemnation because we fall short of it. Everything after, but now, is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and given us salvation and all the benefits of it. But now, these two words are just two incredible, incredible words that he gives us. Uh, similar to the dates that I gave earlier, I gave you a few illustrations here to show a but now, a continental divide in people's lives. You remember Exodus chapter 3. Moses goes up on the mountain. He is 80 years old at this point. He has lived the majority of his life already. But in Exodus chapter 3, Moses has an encounter with God at the burning bush experience. And everything for Moses from then on is pre-burning bush and post-burning bush. Think of Matthew chapter 28. That's where the resurrection is given for us. For the church of Jesus Christ, for the apostles, everything was pre-resurrection and post-resurrection. The disciples ran scared when Jesus was arrested. The disciples stood boldly before those same people who arrested Jesus and proclaimed the gospel message because of the resurrection. And they never tired of preaching the resurrection, not because they didn't have another message to preach. They just couldn't give everything that it taught. Everything was about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. It is a continental divide for the church and for the world. In fact, to the point where sometime later, I think it was in the 600s, they began to look at it, and then officially under Charlemagne, we started referring to the world as B.C. and A.D., before Christ and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, or the year of the Lord. And, and so that became a dividing point. It was a continental divide for them. In Acts chapter 9, you have the story of the Apostle Paul. He had his Damascus Road experience. Everything for Paul was pre-Damascus Road and post-Damascus Road. Because on the Damascus Road, once again, it comes back to the resurrection, he encountered the risen Christ. And everything was transforming. Paul here says, but now... The book of Romans here is, you get the watershed. I, I wrote down a few thoughts here on this. 
He's turning from failure to the fix for that failure. He's turning from our wreck of humanity to God's remedy for it, from our calamity to God's cure, from our problem to God's provision, from our sin to God's salvation. It is a watershed moment. It is a dividing point. But now, apart from the law, what's being presented is distinguished and separated from the law. It is not based on law. This is his first point. It's the only point he's brought out so far. He's going to go much further with it, but this is where he begins. It is a part from the law. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul shares his own story in Philippians 3. And part of it he said, And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. God's righteousness is not earned by our works or by the works of the law. It's received by faith. Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. That is the communication. That is the message that he has to give. It is the heart of the book of Romans. That's what he's trying to communicate to us. It's been manifested. It's been revealed. It's brought into the light for everyone to see. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, we read, But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It's all found in Jesus Christ. Every part of it is found in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 he, that is God the Father, made him, that is Christ the Son, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is used here is not a reference to his attribute of righteousness. Because we receive it by faith, and because it's the righteousness of God in him that's given to us. It's his saving righteousness by which he declares sinners righteous in his sight. That righteousness of God has been revealed, and though it is apart from the law, the law and the prophets give witness to it. That's his next phrase in here. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The entire Old Testament gives support to this. This isn't something new that Paul's coming up with. He is communicating truth that God has given us for some time in his word. In Luke chapter 24, after the resurrection, Jesus comes alongside of two disciples as they're walking on the road that lead, connects Jerusalem with Gaza. It's a desert road. And as he is walking there, he hears them talking, and he joins them, and they don't recognize him. And they're talking about the events that just happened in Jerusalem, about the crucifixion. <clears throat> and they were thinking, we thought that Jesus was, was the one. And notice how he responds to them in verses 25 through 27. It says, and he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. I would have loved to have heard Jesus expound the Old Testament to those people as he started with Moses the law and went to the prophets and demonstrated that they taught about him in Acts chapter 8 you have the story of Philip who was one of the the men who was chosen to be a deacon 
And, and Philip was told by an angel of the Lord to go and join a caravan. And he goes there and he encounters an Ethiopian eunuch. And we're told that Ethiopian eunuch is basically the secretary of the treasury for Queen Candace of the Ethiopians. And he had, been, he had gone to Jerusalem to worship, so he's a proselyte to Judaism. And he's reading the prophet Isaiah. We pick up the text in verse 32. It says, Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture. He preached Jesus to him. All the Old Testament points to Jesus, the law, and the prophets. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you have the great chapter on the resurrection. And it begins with these amazing words. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures is Paul referencing here? He's referencing the Old Testament. Those are the scriptures that they had at that time. And those scriptures told of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll give you one last thought. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus was transfigured before the disciples? And it says he was just, they saw his glory shining through. Jesus had a couple of visitors when he was there. Do you remember who they were? It was Moses and Elijah. And they appeared to him. And I often wondered if they had like name tags on. You know, hi, I'm Moses. How the disciples recognized them. But Moses and Elijah were there. Moses representing the law. Elijah representing the prophets. And God the Father speaks and he says, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased listen to him being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe that is the condition it's through faith in Christ and then he uses the term believe the condition is faith a person must believe this is for all those who believe uh, at one point in John chapter 6, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. After feeding the 5,000, he sends the disciples to the other side of the, the sea. And, and then it, the scripture tells us after a time of prayer, he walks across the lake to get to where they are. The following day, the people are amazed that Jesus is there because they, they don't know how he got there. They don't know that he walked on the water trying to figure out. We know that the disciples left in the boats. He didn't have a boat. And we didn't see him going on the land. How did he get there? They're, they're not really sure. And in John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29, we read, Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we, make, we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. What is the work of God? It is simply to trust what Jesus did. You put your faith, you put your trust, you put your life in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust him and nobody else. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are thrown in jail. And then there's an earthquake. And we're told that the prison doors are open. But not only that, but their shackles all fell off. And when the jailer saw that the doors were open, he knew, I'm toast. I'm about to be killed by the Romans for letting people escape. And before he's able to stab himself, Paul the apostle says to him, 
hey, we're all still here. And it says, he came trembling to them, saying, what must I do to be saved? Because they've been proclaiming the gospel in prison. And they said to him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. A person must believe. The righteousness that God gives is not a by works righteousness. It is a by faith righteousness. Faith is the means by which we receive what God has freely given. You have to trust him. That's how you receive what he has done. It's by faith. It's not by works. William Cunningham, who was a Scottish theologian and a historian in the early uh, to mid-1800s, wrote about this righteousness of God. It's a statement I've shared before with you. He says the following, Under law, God required righteousness from man. Under grace, he gives righteousness to man. The righteousness of God is that righteousness which God's righteousness requires him to require. God has to, because of who he is, have a standard it's a standard that none of us can meet on our own. We've read about that in the first three chapters up to this point. Because of who he is and because of his standard, he has to require something. And he has provided it in the gospel, and we receive it by faith. William Moorhead said the following, The sum total of all that God commands demands approves and himself provides that is his righteousness it's what he commands of us that we cannot attain on our own but he also provides it for us god is the one who provides this righteousness and it's received by faith that's the condition but but your faith isn't what saves you it is the means by which you receive that salvation it, it's Spurgeon put it this way. He said, it's not thy hope in Christ which saves you, it's Christ. It's not thy joy in Christ that saves you, it is Christ. It is not thy faith in Christ that saves you, though that is the instrument. It is Christ's blood and his merit. It's simply the instrument that's being used. I have a bunch of DVDs at home of Tim Hawkins and of Brian Regan. They're incredibly funny. Guess what? There's nothing funny about the DVDs. They're just the means that convey what those guys are communicating. Okay? I can put this thing here on and if I did this, you can't hear a thing. Okay? Because the means to convey it to you, and once again, this wasn't planned. It was just me being, thinking a bunch of other stuff. It's gone. It's not there. That's what faith is. It isn't faith that saves us. It's Christ. Faith is simply the means by which we receive what Christ has done for us. And it is God who gives that to us. How that whole process works, I have no earthly idea. I know I have to trust Christ. But it's in trusting him that I have eternal life as he does his work in us. It's God's righteousness that's received by faith. And it's for those and only for those who believe. And then he gives us a cause for there is no distinction. That's the next phrase. How could Paul say that this righteousness is for everyone? It's because all people, everyone, needs it because none of us in our own merits can accomplish it on our own neither you nor i have enough within us to achieve it and because all of us have failed all of us can receive it simply by faith romans chapter 3 verse 9 which we saw what then are we the jews better than they the gentiles not at all for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. In Romans chapter 10, Paul will say, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches to all 
who call on him, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God is not a respecter of persons. All are under sin. All are equally in need of his grace and his mercy. Every single person. And that brings us to the next word, which is the word comprehensive. It's all. It's for all those who believe. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It includes everyone. Both the problem and the solution are comprehensive. They're universal. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. In John chapter 6, verses 37 through 40, it's not only that all of us have sinned, all of us have those same opportunities to trust. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have been down, excuse me, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given to me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. You know, the same remedy is available to all people who have sinned. Now, in a previous message, we looked at some definitions of the word sin, that we looked at how it's described in our Bibles. Uh, for our purposes here, we're going to say sin simply means to miss the mark or to fall short, which is a pretty comprehensive and the most used term whenever we talk about sin. That's the consequence of it, is that all of us fall short. We fall short of God's standard. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. We don't live by the law. We sin. James 4, 17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's a sin of omission. We know the right thing to do, but we don't do it. We end up sinning when we do that. Romans 14, 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Whenever we have, whenever we lack a God-honoring faith, we live in sin. 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not leading to death. That last part of the phrase talks about physical death. Not all sin leads in immediate physical death. Some of it does. But all unrighteousness is sin. Anything that is unrighteous that's not in the right is sin. You know, that puts all people in the same boat. No human can avoid it because all people fall short. <clears throat> Let's say all of us were to meet uh, down in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Woods Hole is where the ferry leaves to go to Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard is about seven miles from Woods Hole, if, as the crow flies, okay? And to get on the ferry, there, there's a pier, and it's kind of high, so you have a little bit of height. And let's say all of us take a running jump to see how far we can get to Martha's Vineyard on our own. Now, some of us may be able to go a little bit further than others. I imagine most of us are going to go just a few feet. Some may go up to 10, 12, 15 feet, or even further if you've got some speed, because you're up high. You're going to carry just a little bit further, which means you've got to come back a little bit more through that cold water. You know, l Let's say you get some world-class athlete who goes there, and that world-class athlete with the height may be able to go 35 to 40 feet out into the water. But you're all going to fall short, every single one of us. Now, you say, Foad, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of stupid, too. Nobody's going to do that thinking they can do it. Guess what? The standard of God is so much further than Martha's Vineyard. Nobody can achieve it on their own. 
all fall short of God's standard because his standard is perfect holiness. And nobody in humanity has maintained perfect human, perfect holiness since the fall. None whatsoever. All have sinned. And we fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Let me ask you a question. If somebody tells one lie, what does that make them? A liar. Now, they may not be as habitual in their lying as somebody else, but both of them are categorized in the same way. You're a liar if you just tell one lie. If you tell a million lies or one lie, you both get categorized in the same category. You're a liar. There's different perspectives of it. One of them goes much, much further than the other. If somebody steals one time, it makes them a thief. Somebody may have a habit of stealing. Steals a whole lot more. Doesn't even begin to compare. Man, all I stole cost 25 cents at a store. And somebody embezzled a billion dollars on Wall Street. Guess what? There's different degrees in there, but both of them are thieves. Whether it's something that was 25 cents or a billion dollars, it's just a different category, different size but it fall falls under the same heading, you're a thief. All have sinned. Every single one of us have fallen short. And fallen short of what? The glory of God. That's the criteria. It's his standard. And it's a standard we must attain. And we fall short of it. John chapter 11, verse 4. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. The, the Lord's comment here was in regards to when Lazarus had gotten sick and eventually died and Jesus raised him, as we read about in John chapter 11. And he says it's for the glory of God. Now, there's a lot of different ways to define this term, glory of God. My favorite way to define it is to simply say it's to reflect the greatness of someone or something. The best illustration I've ever used with regards to that is go out on a clear night and look at the moon. It's pretty amazing to see. What's really amazing is that it's a rock. It has zero abilities to shine. We see stars because they're not rocks. They're basically big balls of fire that are sending stuff toward us. That's why we can see stars. But the moon has zero ability to shine. How do we see the moon? We see the moon because where it sits, it reflects off of our sun. And we see the greatness of our sun in the moon. The moon glorifies the sun because it reflects the greatness of it. But that's not the only definition of glorification. Another definition would be uh, as found in John chapter 12, verse 43. For they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. That idea of approval, the, the greatest glory is to be able to get praise from God or his approval, to saying, I'm with you on this. But so many, so many of us, put us in that category, put myself in that category, so often we seek the approval of men rather than the approval of God. We all fall short of his glory, and we fall short of his approval. And that brings us to Paul's, what I call Paul's revolutionary revelation. Uh, I got that term from Josh McDowell. He's the first person I ever heard share that as he did a series of teachings on Romans. This was back when I had first become a Christian, back in the 80s. But this revolutionary revelation, which isn't revolutionary in the sense of being new, it's been there in the Old Testament. It's just the way that Paul put it in these verses that make it so amazing. So what I want to do as we conclude is kind of whet our appetites for what's coming, where this thing just gets really exciting 
even beyond what we've already seen. I want you to look at the last text with us here as we conclude. Look at Romans chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. These are some of the key terms that we need to define and work through that make this section such an amazing section. Paul said, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance or tolerance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's an amazing, amazing passage. God has been so gracious to us. But now, we're on the other side because of what Jesus did. But that has to be received by faith. It isn't just the fact that Jesus died and bore your sin. It isn't just the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. You and I have to place our faith in Jesus Christ. That is the means by which we grasp what God has done for us. We simply trust Jesus and nothing else. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, I am grateful uh, for this uh, text. I'm grateful for this microphone still being up here that I can use to communicate. It becomes a means by which the voice is heard just as the video camera becomes the means by which the service is communicated to others. And Lord, you are gracious in so many ways. Lord, what you have done for us is apart from the law. It's apart from our works. It's a part of anything that we have done or can do because we fall short of it. But now, apart from the law, your righteousness has been manifested it is witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ thank you so much for that lord thank you that though we all have sinned and fallen short of your glory you have declared us righteous because of faith in jesus because of what he did and because of the means of us trusting him. Oh God, would you help us as your people to walk in that truth for your glory. And to be a people who share and communicate that message with others through our lives and through our words. Lord, we commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.